legal foundation of the state of Israel is what is known as the Balfour Declaration. This declaration was issued in 1917. A man in the government of Britain named Balfour wrote a paper and promised the Jews a national home. The national home he promised them was an area which Britain was colonizing, Palestine. Palestine didn't belong to the British. Just like Ireland doesn't belong to the British, even though they have troops there. Social democracy is repression with a soft glove on it. You know, the reason it survives is that we're able to sit in America or in England and we're able to get our paint and our steak and whatever goes on. And we don't mind whenever occasionally we hear about some poor shit being killed in a prison or, or you know, all this repression that goes on because we are comfortable enough. It's hard to identify the enemy. But the same people who are giving this, us this liberal thing here are doing, doing all the repression in Northern Ireland and in Israel. It's yeah. just the, it's exactly the same government and the same people, but there they've had to take the mask off because there's, there's opposition to them, you know. And people should be able to make the connection and say, well, if this is what they're doing here because people don't agree with them, then it's the same person, you know. You, you, you can't sort of divide the two things and say, oh, well, they've got to do that in Northern Ireland because of the situation, but at home they're really nice. I think it's about time we stop those of us who support, as most of us do, Israel in this body, for apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made. None. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. States is a peaceful nation, and where our strength and determination are clear, our words need merely to convey conviction, not belligerence. If we are strong, our strength will speak for itself. If we are weak, words will be of no help. Many people wonder why Irish people support Palestine and have done so consistently over many years. The main reason is a shared history of being plagued with settler colonialism at the hands of Britain, among other imperialist powers. However, this single reason, the entire concept of settler colonialism, is a very broad and to an extent complex topic that may be difficult to come to terms with. Even for people who come from countries affected by this phenomenon, who simply take what is told to them at face value by the education system and various other aspects of the ideological state apparatus of their respective countries, particularly if they come from Western countries. This video aims to address this complex topic, drawing parallels from the Irish and Palestinian experiences of settler colonialism. The parallels described in this video do not make an exhaustive summary of all of the similarities between Ireland and Palestine in this respect. There are simply too many to address in a single YouTube video. Rather, this video aims to leave you guys with a better understanding of how both Palestine and Ireland have had many shared incidents of human suffering and economic plundering at the hands of the colonizers and how this has led to the long-standing solidarity that both have shown for each other's respective struggles against imperialism. In doing so, we will answer the question, why does Ireland support Palestine? In order to answer this question, we will cover the following. My reaction to events in Palestine since October 7th, 2023, which are still ongoing at the time of recording this video. We will also cover settler colonialism as a working framework, shared lived experiences between Irish and Palestinian people of settler colonialism, history of internment in both Ireland and Palestine, and hunger striker solidarity, a history of Irish aid to Palestine, how media and propaganda has been weaponized by the colonizer against the colonized in both instances. And finally, we look at the class contradictions which make the question of this video a little more complicated. On the 7th of October 2023, 
I woke up to the news that various organisations from a broad range of Palestinian society had joined forces to combat the oppressive colonial force that was occupying their homeland. However, that is not how the corporate media saw it. They described it as an unprovoked attack on Israel and the Gaza border. However, this completely ignores a century of settler colonialism in the region, where Palestinians were forcibly expelled from their homes through murder, rape, torture, humiliation and being forced to live in an open-air prison with restrictions to the basic necessities of human life. All of this is infamously referred to as the Nakba or the catastrophe in Arabic and it is not an historic event. It is ongoing as you can see through the continued oppression in Gaza. Fishermen are kept inland so they cannot fish in their own waters. All of this while being a target for vastly excessive violence from Israeli forces. Israel covers for itself through various mass scale propaganda campaigns that if you were to believe the highly manufactured narratives parroted by Western media, you would find yourself thinking that it didn't blow up any hospitals, despite having called the hospitals in question multiple times, saying that they were going to blow up said hospitals and then proceeding to blow them up. The colonizers also cover for their actions through weaponized language by labeling the oppressed as terrorists and using other loaded language and propaganda used to dehumanize and demonize those who they oppress, a tactic all too familiar in Ireland. It is not surprising, therefore, that the Palestinian people want to change that. As James Connolly said himself, none so fitted to break the chains as they who wear them. But whosoever carries the outworks of the citadel of oppression, the working class alone can raise it to the ground. Such oppression has drawn solidarity from all oppressed peoples around the world, and Ireland is no different. This video aims to give a descriptive account of the affinity that Irish people have with Palestinians and their struggle against their Zionist occupiers as both stories stem from one common protagonist, British imperialism. While the people of Washington sleep safely in their beds The people of Palestine They're mourning their dead Good Irish whiskey. Good Irish whiskey. <laughs> US military think tanks have documented the methods and rationale for Churchill's dirty war in Ireland in great detail and for good reason. War on the Rocks, a website staffed by people who work for the pro-NATO think tank Foreign Policy Research Institute, had clearly recorded Churchill's dirty war in Ireland. It is in Churchill's strategy and that of the British imperialists at the time that helped shape modern day white supremacist settler colonialism. He said about the Palestinians while referencing the Native Americans to the Peel Commission on the Jewish Homeland in Palestine in 1937. I do not agree that the dog in a manger has the final right to the manger, even though he may have lain there for a very long time. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. British colonial policy even drew admiration from some other famous characters. I like the British people. Their colonial policy was unthinkable. Adolf Hitler Ireland and Palestine have a shared history of being colonised and oppressed by divide and rule strategies through apartheid. This gave rise to many civil rights movements and armed resistance campaigns like the so-called Troubles and the more recent Al-Aqsa Flood in occupied Palestine. From as early as the 1100s, the British began colonising Ireland through various means. As with Palestine, the more the native population fought and reclaimed their land, the more resources and military and state manpower the British poured into the subjugation of this native population. By the 14th century, the Anglo-Norman settlers were becoming acclimatised to Irish language and culture and had famously become more Irish than the Irish themselves. However, in a bid to combat this, King Edward III of England issued the Statute of Kilkenny in 1366 to ban the Irish language, culture and dress. Later on in the 16th century, the penal laws in Ireland were introduced to deprive the native Catholic population through land theft and deprivation of language and cultural rights. Catholics were also banned from owning horses over the value of five pounds as these were considered to have value for military activity i.e. could be used to overthrow the British. 
This colonial subjugation and oppression of the native Irish population all helped set the framework for Israel's colonisation of Palestine with the assistance of Britain in its early stages and then, as time went on, all of the global imperialist powers became involved. In November 1917, a letter to the Zionist movement, which originated from a pamphlet written by Theodore Herzl, the father of Zionism, or the spiritual father of Israel as he is known by Zionists. This pamphlet was called Judenstein that or Jewish state through that document the template for settler colonialism that was developed in Ireland was about to be replicated in Palestine only more ruthless and callous and in a shorter space of time Arthur James Balfour who signed the Balfour declaration as Britain's foreign secretary had previously served as chief secretary of Ireland he was well renowned for giving the order for police to open fire on a land reform protest in Mitchellstown County Cork in 1887 three people were murdered and afterwards he was known as Bloody Balfour. The Balfour Declaration's purpose was to form a loyal Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabism, according to Ronald Storrs, the self-proclaimed first military governor of Palestine since Pontius Pilate. By loyal Jewish Ulster, Storrs meant a replication of the colonial stronghold that is the Orange State in the north of Ireland. We will dive further into what this means exactly for Palestine later on in the video. Herbert Samuel, the British Home Secretary in 1916, oversaw the internment of almost 2,000 people involved in the Easter Rising here in Ireland. Internment would later become a major tool of the British state in the north of Ireland, as well as the Zionist state of Israel in persecuting Palestinians. Samuel had also approved Roger Caseman's hanging. Subsequently, Samuel became the first High Commissioner of Palestine as Britain took charge of its administration between World Wars I and II. Unsurprisingly, when this was put into action, the native Palestinian population revolted. Following this, Winston Churchill, then colonial secretary, pushed for a picked force of white gendarmerie to be established in Palestine. Churchill intended that this gendarmerie would be made up of men who had served with the Crown Forces during Ireland's Tan War, or most commonly known, the War of Independence. This white gendarmerie comprised members of the infamous Black and Tans, who were renowned for torturing the population of Ireland through burning of properties, harassment, savage beatings, extra judicial killings, collective punishment, among other atrocities. More on those later on in the video. Douglas Duff, a black and tan from Galway who was sent to Palestine, made this comment about his time spent in Palestine. Most of us were so infected by the sense of our own superiority over these lesser breeds that we scarcely regarded these people as human. This sentiment is synonymous with recent comments made by Israeli Defence Minister Yoav Gallant who referred to the Palestinians in Gaza as human animals. Despite the denials of the colonizers, the founders of Zionism had laid the foundations for a massive scale colonial project. These founders of Zionism were crystal clear as to what the aims of their project were. Vladimir Jabotinsky, a post-Theodore Herzl Zionist ideologue who mentored and inspired many Israeli leaders, set out in no uncertain terms what the stark reality of the Zionist project was. It is utterly impossible to obtain obtain the voluntary consent of the Palestine Arabs for converting Palestine from an Arab country into a country with a Jewish majority. Every native population in the world resists colonists as long as it has the slightest hope of being able to rid itself of the danger of being colonised. That is what the Arabs in Palestine are doing and what they will persist in doing as long as there remains a solitary spark of hope that they will be able to prevent the transformation of Palestine into the land of Israel from the Iron Wall available on the Jewish Virtual Library website. Using even more callous language, he said, Zionism stands or falls by the question of armed force. It is important to speak Hebrew, but unfortunately, it is even more important to be able to shoot or else I am through with playing at colonising. This could be seen with Israeli settlers queuing to receive weapons from the state authorities in order to finish the work of these Zionist ideologues. These founding fathers of Zionism knew exactly what they were doing with the settler colonial framework embracing white supremacy over the indigenous population. The pretense of the state of Israel being a Jewish safe haven or homeland falls flat when you acknowledge the fact that one third of Holocaust survivors who live there live in poverty and the state 
state treats Ethiopian Jews like second-class citizens. All of this was built on the colonial framework that had been developed in Ireland, with many incidents happening in both countries which are almost identical in nature. Brian Boy McGee, a poem by Ethna Carberry, told of the 1641 massacre of nearly all of the inhabitants of Island McGee, now a fiercely loyalist area of County Antrim in the north of Ireland. This was done by English and Scottish soldiers. In the poem, Brian Boy McGee sees his mother hanged by her hair from a tree and his brothers and extended family members brutally murdered. All the while, he and his father fought off the invaders. Once these invaders had finished killing most of the men, they had driven much of the women and children off the edge of a cliff to their deaths. This, among many other atrocities the world over, bears a great resemblance to what happened in Palestine in the early days of colonisation. On the 9th of April 1948, just weeks before the creation of the State of Israel, members of the Ergon and Stern gang Zionist militias attacked the village of Der Yassin, killing at least 107 Palestinians, an event known as the Der Yin Massacre. According to testimonies from the perpetrators and surviving victims, many of the people slaughtered from those who were tied to trees and burned to death to those lined up against the wall and shot by submachine guns were women children and the elderly as news of the atrocity spread thousands fled their villages in fear eventually some 700,000 palestinians would flee or be forcibly displaced at the outset of israel's creation making the massacre a decisive moment in palestinian history in both incidences we could see wanton violence being meted out by the colonizers onto the nation of populations, forcing mass displacement of entire villages and towns. Those who survive are left with psychological scars and contrary to the hopes of the colonizers, these would not be erased through a vacuum of information over long periods of time. Another trend among the Zionist colonizers that was adopted from the British was the humiliation of colonized people by forcing them to hold the flag of the colonizer and swear allegiance to them and subsequently treating them in a depraved manner or even ending their lives altogether. One such instance in Ireland was in 1920 during the Tan War where two Irish civilians were forced to parade around Dungarvan in County Waterford by British soldiers with one end of a large British flag tied around their necks. Both were beaten and brutalised with their bodies dumped outside the town. One other such incident in Ireland involved Pat Hart pictured on the right beside Tom Hales, both of the famous West Cork Brigade. Pat Hart, as pictured, was forced to hold up a Union Jack by Crown forces after suffering a heavy beating. He suffered a mental breakdown and spent most of the rest of his life in Broadmoor Asylum in England as a result of his treatment at the hands of the British forces. He returned to Ireland in 1922 after the treaty and later died in 1924. The modern day Israelis copied this technique and used it against Palestinians and broadcasted it on TikTok as can be seen from the images on screen. The two Palestinian men are forced to hold the flag of Israel and say, long live Israel. The IDF soldier who posted this put a description in Hebrew saying, a new punishment for every terrorist arrested. A must shout with Israel alive with the Israeli flag in hand. What do you say about that? The soldier is clearly reveling in the humiliation of a Palestinian person, as can be sensed from the tone of that description. Such instances have been a staple of settler colonialism in an attempt to bludgeon the native populations into submission to the colonial power. However, these acts of callousness always come from a place of weakness and cowardice. During the Tan War, the British Empire was furious at those who dared challenge the fragile hold that it had on Ireland. This is why they released the Black and Tans on the civilian population. In 1920, at a particularly heightened time where pogroms were being carried out by loyalist mobs against the nationalist Catholic community of Belfast, the Ulster volunteer Air Force, a private loyalist militia, went on joint patrols with both British soldiers and the Royal Irish Constabulary, the British police force in Ireland before partition. After partition, the northern section of the RIC became the infamous RUC, or Royal Ulster Constabulary. The Unionist leader, James Craig, demanded the establishment of a special constabulary, which in effect meant making the UVF an official government force and arming them. This amalgamation of all these organisations formed a type 
type of settler militia that did the dirty work for the British in Ireland. This tactic is still used in Palestine to this day. The use of far-right politicians to bolster morale for settler militias is a common tactic in both Israel and Ireland, which has unleashed havoc on civilian populations in both countries and fit into the colonial dirty war framework devised by Churchill and the leaders of Zionism. This could be seen with Israeli government minister Ben Gavir, who has visibly waved weapons around when rallying settler militias in ultra-nationalist settler extremist meetings. With hardline ultra-nationalist Itamar Ben Gavir now in the post of national security minister. He's already pledged to hand out 4,000 rifles to settlers in the occupied territories for free. In November 2022, he was appointed Israel's Minister of National Security. He openly supports shoot-to-kill policies against Palestinian protesters and wants security forces to be immune from criminal prosecution, just like the infamous Legacy Bill in Ireland, which shields British soldiers who served during the conflict in the North from prosecution for massacres and other crimes against civilians. In 2007, he was convicted of incitement to racism and supporting a terrorist organisation. Gavir began his political career in the extremist Kahanis movement, renowned for its extreme settler colonial ideals. The sovereign state of Israel and these damned Arabs here had better learn that if they want to stay here, they'll sit here quietly or get the hell out. There is no such thing as an Arab village in the state of Israel. It is a Jewish village that is temporarily inhabited by Arabs. Coming back to Ben Gavir for a moment, due to his associations with and dealings with Kahan and his movement, he was rejected from the Israeli army for being too extreme. Today, he is in charge of Israel's national security, despite being charged and convicted of several offences related to participation in a terrorist organisation. At the beginning of the Al-Aqsa flood campaign, he has been distributing weapons to settlers similar to how the British supplied arms to loyalists in Ireland. Another tactic used by both Israel and Britain was collective punishment, which is illegal under international law. This is where the colonial entity shows its cowardice by attacking civilian populations with disproportionate force. Since October the 7th, the Israeli military conducted widely disproportionate actions on Gaza in the form of airstrikes, attacking unarmed civilians in a craven act of weakness as a form of collective punishment for the resistance making a mockery of the seemingly invincible Israeli intelligence and defence systems. Collective punishment has often been used by the British throughout Irish history. One such incident was the burning of Cork City on the night of the 11th of December 1920 in retaliation for an IRA ambush of Black and Tans, which resulted in 12 being wounded and one fatally. The Black and Tans burned Cork city centre to the ground, looted businesses, assaulted those who were trying to put out the fires, and outright terrorised the local population. Fatalities included one woman who died from a heart attack when Black and Tans burst into her house. One other such incident is the sack of Balbriggan in September of the same year. David Lloyd George, during a speech at the Guildhall in London in 1920, said that the British had murder by the throat. He said this in response to the IRA's effective use of guerrilla tactics against the Crown forces. The RIC, or the police, had been supported by auxiliaries, i.e. the Black and Tans, in order to counter the IRA's guerrilla units or flying columns. A severe blow was delivered to the British intelligence systems by surgical strikes carried out by the IRA's flying columns, and the wiping out of an entire British auxiliary unit by the West Cork Brigade under the leadership of Tom Barry at the Battle of Kilmichael in response to the British abusing the rules of surrender to attempt to kill more IRA volunteers. When I heard these fellas shouting, we surrender, we surrender, we surrender, but we kept jogging on to them and we saw them, some of them throw their rifles away. And when they did, three of this section stood up and two of them, the, the Aussies opened fire immediately on them. And they killed the two of them after surrendering. <coughs> they killed them with revolver fire. They threw their rifles away and they killed them. They were a short distance, 20 yards from them. 
They killed them with revolver fire. When they opened fire again, we kept jogging up and we were not recognized by the second lorry of these fellas. And we got within 30 yards of them and we dropped. And I gave the order to fire. And I shouted at the same time to the section, keep firing and don't stop till I tell you. But these fellows, some of them turned to us, but eventually, after four or five minutes, uh, we had killed a lot of them. They tried to surrender again, and I said, don't take any surrender, and I want here and now, publicly, <coughs> to take full responsibility that we wouldn't take prisoners after they, their false surrender and after killing two of our men. <coughs> I only regretted one thing, and I'm speaking now almost 45 years after it, and it was that I hadn't warned these men of this false surrender trick, which is as old as war itself. In response to these victories by the IRA, the Black and Tans and the British had carried out collective punishment by shooting civilians at Croke Park as well as the sack of Balbriggan, in which nearly 50 homes were burned down by the Black and Tans, who were laughing and cheering as they did so. Such incidents were repeated throughout Ireland at the time and are strikingly similar to incidents which happened recently in occupied Palestine. Israeli settlers rampage through a Palestinian village in the occupied West Bank, hours after two Israeli brothers were killed nearby by a Palestinian gunman. Another Palestinian was killed in this violence, dozens injured. The army was protecting the settlers, says a local man, though now Israel's military calls the settler rampage an act of terror. It's the latest big flashpoint amid growing violence between Palestinians and Israelis, and it comes as Israeli settlements are expanding across the occupied West Bank, with the encouragement of a new ultra-nationalist government in Israel. Palestinians in the West Bank are counting the costs of Israeli revenge attacks. I was here yesterday when the incident occurred. I didn't know how to escape. They immediately closed all the roads and escape routes, so I was forced to stay here. I locked the door, and then the settlers arrived and burned things. They set fire to all the wood I had and burned my car. They burned everything. The deadly violence in and around the city of Huwara began just hours after two Israeli brothers were killed by a Palestinian gunman. The Israeli military said it's still searching for the Palestinian who shot the brothers and that it had moved in hundreds of extra troops. But the government has called for calm. I understand the hard feelings, but this is not the way forward. We do not take the law into our own hands. The Israeli government and defense forces are the ones who should be crushing our enemies. In both Ireland and Palestine, the prison system has been used as a weapon on both colonised populations. Violations against prisoners in both instances included poor quality food, withdrawal of bedding and clothing from the prisoners, mistreatment when being transferred to and from court, beatings, torture, deprivation of food and turning cells upside down and the removal of prisoners' belongings, among many others. Both prison regimes have one common origin, British imperialism. The introduction of internment without trial and criminalisation of those who oppose the occupiers' presence in their countries only heightened the level of acrimony between prisoners and the authorities. In both Ireland and Palestine, this has led prisoners to take on prison authorities with the only weapon they had, their bodies. 
Hunger strikes were used in both instances against the prison establishment. Bobby Sands and Kader Adnan are renowned around the world for their courage and dignity when taking on the oppressive regime in this manner. Before the commencement of his hunger strike, Bobby Sands famously said, I am standing on the threshold of another trembling world. May God have mercy on my soul. Just as courageously, Kader Adnan became the first Palestinian person to lose their life on hunger strike due to the ever-increasing brutality of the Israeli prison authorities following in the steps of Margaret Thatcher. In the Irish context, the hunger strike came from the Celtic tradition known as Antrusket from the Brehan Laws, in which a person who had a grievance against someone more powerful could fast at the aggressor's doorstep until societal pressure compelled the aggressor to address the grievance raised. To allow someone to die at your doorstep as a result of this would bring great shame and dishonour on the individual. In the words of another Irish hunger striker, Terence McSweeney, it is not those who can inflict the most, but those who can endure the most who will conquer. This is true not only for Ireland, but Palestine and its people. When Bobby Sands died on hunger strike, Palestinian prisoners in Nafa prison smuggled a letter expressing their solidarity. To the families of the martyrs oppressed by the British ruling class, to the families of Bobby Sands and his martyred comrades, we, revolutionaries of the Palestinian people who are under the terrorist rule of Zionism, write you this letter from the desert prison of Nafa. We extend our salutes and solidarity with you in the confrontation against the oppressive terrorist rule enforced upon the Irish people by the British ruling elite. We salute the heroic struggle of Bobby Sands and his comrades, for they have sacrificed the most valuable possession of any human being. They gave their lives for freedom. From here in Nafa prison, where savage snakes and desert sands penetrate our cells, from here under the yoke of Zionist occupation, we stand alongside you. From behind our cell bars, we support you, your people and your revolutionaries who have chosen to confront death. Since the Zionist occupation, our people have been living under the worst conditions. Our militants who have chosen the road of liberty and chosen to defend our land, people and dignity have been suffering for many years. In the prisons, we are confronting Zionist oppression and their systematic application of torture. Sunlight does not enter our cell. Basic necessities are not provided, yet we confront the Zionist hangmen, the enemies of life. Many of our militant comrades have been martyred under torture by the fascists, allowing them to bleed to death. Others have been martyred because Israeli prison administrators do not provide needed medical care. The noble and just hunger strike is not in vain. In our struggle against the occupation of our homeland for freedom from the new Nazis, it stands as a clear symbol of the historical challenge against the terrorists. Our people in Palestine and in the Zionist prisons are struggling as your people are struggling against the British monopolies and we will both continue until victory. On behalf of the prisoners of Nafa, we support Support your struggle and cause of freedom against English domination, against Zionism and against fascism in the world. During the Troubles in the North, the Irish National Liberation Movement had close ties with that of Palestine. Both naturally rejected the Balfour Declaration. IRA volunteers had trained in PLO training camps in the Middle East, as well as receiving weapons. The IRA also gained significant support from Libya's Muammar Gaddafi. The public enemy number one in America gave an interview to an Irish television team which caused a hum on the international wire services with his words. And if I were the leader of the south of Ireland, I would consider that the north is colonized and I would fight to liberate that part of my country. And uh, that uh, my country is deficient in its independence in that case. The Irish government protested very strongly to Libya after those remarks by Major Jaloud and said that the provisional IRA was the enemy of the state and was not supported by the people. Do you accept that? Let's say, 
يجب ان نشكر نحن على على تاييدنا لقضيتكم. اون ذا كونتري وي شود بي ثانكت فور اور بوزيشن اون يور كونتري. كيف اذا انتم ايدتوا قضيه فلسطينيه نحن نشكركم. اف يو سبورت ذا فلسطينيان كوز وي وي ثانك يو. لان فلسطين جزء من الوطن العربي ومحتل. Uh, Palestine is part of the Arab homeland and uh, it is occupied. So whoever supports its liberation, we, we thank him. Have you actually supplied weapons or money directly to the IRA? Uh, we are obliged to support such a cause and we think it is a just one. Do I take it from that answer that yes, you have supplied arms and money? I have not said that. But uh, we are obliged to support the Northern Ireland cause as a liberation cause, as a just cause. And the British presence is considered as a colonialist presence. And all the uh, youth, uh, the Irish youth in the north and the south should participate in the struggle of the, of the liberation in the north of the, country, of the island. Gaddafi's support for both struggles would inevitably lead to a strong sense of solidarity between the two causes. Irish Republicans uphold Palestinian sovereignty to this day. Adversely, loyalists in the north favour Israel as they are settlers or descendants of planters and therefore natural allies, burning Palestinian flags alongside Irish tricolour flags on the 12th of July. Israeli flags and other Zionist imagery can often be seen in loyalist areas with Israeli flags often flying alongside Union Jacks. The Irish working class have a long history of providing aid to the Palestinian people and the Israeli government has a long history of trying to intercept it. One notable example was the interception by the Israeli military of the aid flotilla Rachel Corrie, named after the 23-year-old American activist who had been crushed to death by an Israeli bulldozer at Rafah in 2003. We will stay on channel 16, over. Our home port of registry is Pyon Pen, Cambodia, over. My second question, what is your flag registry? Cambodia. Cambodia, over. My next question is, what is your international call sign? X-ray, X-ray Juliet. It's no, an no. X-ray uniform, Juliet, whiskey, is it, is. Cargo? it is humanitarian cargo. Over. Uh, yes, our planned destination is Gaza. Over. I guess it's your understanding also that the Israeli Navy cannot and will not allow you to reach Gaza. Is that okay? Given that we cannot let you to uh, we are prepared to let the UN come and inspect the cargo to make sure that there's nothing of any um, any threat to the Israeli government or the Israeli people, and then we would we will be prepared to to, con, uh, to continue on into Gaza. Over. Are you proposing inspection at sea or inspection in port? Uh, we would be proposing an inspection at sea by an independent body, i.e. the UN. Over. Are you aware that whether or not such an eventuality comes out, cargo to Gaza in such cases can only be shipped overland through a stop? Are you aware of this, Derek? Over. This is most of our equipment at the moment would be reconstruction, educational and toys. Over. Derek, you've noted several issues of government policy. Obviously, government policy is something I'm limited when it comes to work in discussing that. I would note, however, that circumstances have changed since your last visit. I'm also informed that there is a policy review to do with the transfer of cargo that arrives in Stord. I'm also informed that serious, authentic consideration will be given to transfer 
carrying all or most of the cargo you bring to a ship. We are a small cargo vessel, as you can see, where we're carrying less than 1,000 ton of aid, and we are no threat to the Israeli people or the Israeli government. Over. Mr. Linda, you are hereby requested to change your course and refrain from entering the area. I repeat, delivery of humanitarian supplies to the civilian population in the Gaza Strip it is possible through the formal land crossings between Israel and the Gaza Strip, subject to prior coordination with the Israeli authorities. Received uh, just one mistake. It's the MV Rachel. You do realize we are in international waters. We have not violated the 20 mile zone and we have not in, at any stage entered the 20 mile zone. Over. David, did you copy my last message? It was, we are not inside the 20 mile zone. We have not violated Israeli water. We are still in international water. Did you copy this last message? Over. Do realize that this is in international waters and that you are detaining us in international waters without violating any any laws of the Israeli state or of any uh, or uh, any maritime laws over. Affinity for the Palestinian cause is also present among members of the Irish diaspora with Celtic football club fans in Scotland often flying the Palestinian flag alongside the tricolour at matches. However, since the start of Al-Aqsa flood, UEFA had deemed the Palestinian flag to be provocative messages of an offensive nature and had banned it from being flown at matches. A group of Republican Celtic fans, the Green Brigade, who had a history of supporting the Ada Celtic Football Academy in the Ada refugee camp in Palestine, defied the Celtic board's request to refrain from waving the Palestinian flag, suffering real consequences such as having their season tickets revoked. This reprimand for fans expressing solidarity for a cause so dear to the fan base and Irish people in general is an affront to the history of the club, with one of its founding members, Patrick Welsh, being involved in the 1867 Fenian uprising. As a side note, Celtic's second manager, Willie Maley, was a soldier from County Clare who allowed Patrick to flee to Scotland before he ever got involved with Celtic. The Irish trade union movement had also funded the James Connolly Surgical Unit, which resides in Al Auda Hospital in northern Gaza, which, like the rest of Gaza, had been suffering from airstrikes. The image you see on screen is an anti-Irish cartoon used by the British in the 1800s. As scholar Lewis Party Curtis notes in his Apes and Angels, the Irishman in Victorian caricature, it was comforting for some Englishmen to believe, on the basis of the best scientific authority in the Anthropological Society of London, that their own facial angles and features were as far removed from those of apes, Irishmen and Negroes as was humanly possible. After the outbreak of Fenian violence in the mid-1860s, Paddy, a common derogatory term among the British for an Irish person, descended further to find himself a niche somewhere between the white negro and the anthropoid apes. This touches on the issue of the Irish not having always been considered white. If I were to go into it right now, it would lead to a massive tangent. But suffice to say for the moment, it is propaganda used to dehumanise a marginalised group at the time in order to justify the oppression of that group. Jumping ahead to the present day, you can see a Zionist human rights lawyer, a contradiction in terms, tweeting dehumanising anti-Palestinian propaganda 
which borrowed the technique from German Nazi propaganda of conflating the group being oppressed with insects that must be stomped on or eradicated. This was all highlighted in the Twitter community note below the post. One example of German Nazi propaganda using this technique is the poster entitled Jews are lice, they cause typhoid. This just further proves that Zionism is not the same as Judaism, but rather a continuation of the fascism of Nazi Germany, as could be seen with the repression of pro-Palestinian demonstrations and organisations in Germany by the authorities there and also across the Western world. But to return to the main point, Throughout history, the media has often been a powerful weapon in dictating how the oppressed should counter their oppressors. During the Troubles in Ireland, the British media were a considerable force in manufacturing narratives that surrounded the Irish National Liberation Movement. Peaceful civil rights marches received more favourable treatment from the media, as this was seen as a non-violent way of the oppressed class seeking their rights. Despite this, the events at Bloody Sunday in Derry showed that even peaceful demonstrations were not beyond the wrath of the oppressive British state. This can be seen in the liberal notion that Palestinians should also protest against their oppression peacefully, completely ignoring the callous violence that Israel has inflicted on demonstrators at such events. One very recent example was a Palestinian non-violent protest in 2020 called the Great March of Return. Here they peacefully protested Israeli occupation near the fence that surrounds and blockades Gaza. They protested peacefully, non-violently, marching, chanting and singing and waving the Palestinian flag as they resisted Israeli occupation and the oppression that they've suffered since the end of World War II. And as we've all seen, Israel Israeli occupation forces use snipers to shoot men, women and children peacefully protesting near the Israeli occupation fence, shooting civilians from Israeli territory into Gaza. In both instances, the media completely ignored the facts of what actually happened, ignoring eyewitness accounts and overtly protecting those responsible, along with the state and legal system. This happened in the decades following Bloody Sunday in Derry. The names of the soldiers involved were only made public knowledge as late as 20 2021, when parliamentary privilege was used to name Soldier F as David Cleary. British soldiers who served during the Troubles are now shielded from prosecution by the infamous Legacy Bill. Therefore, it is imperative not to allow Liberals to steal the narrative, as it ultimately protects those responsible for oppression. This was seen in a tweet from the IOF, in which the official Israeli military account refers to Al-Aqsa flood as Israel's bloody Sunday. Those, those beautiful kids of that music festival. Early morning, October 7th, as the sun is rising in the desert sky, stars of David, they took your life. But they could not take your pride Could not take your pride This brazen conflation of the truth was naturally met with outrage both in Ireland and around the world. In a statement from Kate Nash, a campaigner for the Bloody Sunday March Committee and sibling of William Nash, who was killed on Bloody Sunday in 1972, she said the following, This is beyond outrageous. To have the memory of our innocent dead sullied by the apartheid forces of the Israeli state will cause deep hurt and anger in Derry. The IDF commit Bloody Sunday type massacres every day of the week in occupied Palestine. Just like in Derry, their killers operate with impunity and Palestinians receive no justice. This happened before it later transpired that Bono has personal financial interests tied in with Israel as the Clarence Hotel, owned by himself and the Edge of U2, was sold for 43 million euro to the Dean Hotel Group, financed by a loan from the Israeli bank Leonmi, the first Zionist bank which has directly funded settlements in the West Bank and East 
Jerusalem. This again touches on a point raised earlier about the struggle for the liberation of Palestine is purely class based with Zionist interests being firmly rooted in the base and the superstructure of the imperial core manifesting itself through bourgeois celebrity media and finance capital. It is up to us the working classes of the world to struggle against this. While it is safe to say that we have established that the Irish working class would always maintain its solidarity with Palestine, in an official capacity, the picture is a little more mixed, should we say, when it comes to the bourgeoisie comprador class. To start with a positive note, Frank Aiken, the former Irish Minister for External Affairs, as well as ex-Chief of Staff of the Anti-Treaty IRA, said that the upholding of the safety of the Palestinian Arab refugees was the main and most pressing objective of Irish policy in the Middle East in the eyes of the Irish government. In 2010, after the use of Irish passports by Mossad agents in the murder of a Hamas official in Dubai, Michal Martin, now the leader of the Fianna Fáil party, but then the Irish foreign minister, said about the usurpation of the Irish state in this manner, the misuse of Irish passports by a state with which Ireland enjoys friendly, if sometimes frank, bilateral relations, is clearly unacceptable and requires a firm response. Keep Michal Martin's criticism in mind, as we will see a major U-turn in a moment. The real interests of the ruling classes here in Ireland, in terms of its connection to Zionism, lie in the connections of a man called Robert Briscoe, a Jewish man and a founding member of the Fianna Fáil party, also known as Eamon de Valera's right-hand man, later went on to become a Zionist and was visited by Vladimir Jabotinsky, the same Vladimir Jabotinsky from earlier on in the video in 1938. Briscoe gave advice on training and organisation of a physical force insurgency and the strategy and tactics of guerrilla warfare, gleaned from his experiences during the Tan War and subsequent counter-revolution known as the Irish Civil War. He served on Jabotinsky's new Zionist organisation, a militant, ultra-nationalist breakaway from the mainstream Zionist movement. He was a major advocate for the State of Israel, both in Ireland and the US, later on in life. De Valera and other members of the Republican movement at the time initially supported the Zionist movement, but later that support ran dry when the Zionists accepted the 1937 British plan to partition Palestine Palestine and create a Jewish state which was destined to oppress the Palestinian population. At the League of Nations, Eamon de Valera denounced the partition of Palestine as cruel and unjust, a carbon copy of Ireland's own partition by the British 15 years earlier. He said, if the Zionists and the British are on the same side of partition then, we cannot support the Zionists. This historical connection between the founding members of Fianna Fáil and the Zionist movement may somewhat explain why the Israeli ambassador to Ireland was invited to the Fianna Fáil Ardesh or annual general meeting in late 2023, just weeks after the Al-Aqsa flood started. This of course was much to the outrage of the majority of the Irish public. It may also explain why the leader of that party Michal Martin was given a guided tour of Israel on the day that the Dáil was voting on whether to expel the ambassador. Needless to say, that motion was defeated, despite the wishes of the vast amounts of people in this country, in true Comprador class fashion. This interesting detail helps to show how the struggle against Zionism can only be seen as class-based and not a struggle between individual countries or political parties within the bourgeois electoral system, as many may wrongly believe. Any other interpretation of that would be liberal and therefore unhelpful. The ruling class, not only in Ireland but in nearly every other Western country, clearly stand with Israel despite a few token words of criticism that may or may not be offered in order to save face with the public. In doing so, they are complicit in the genocide against Palestinians and we, as the working classes of the world, have a duty to stand alongside the Palestinians. The international bourgeoisie will always side with capital, regardless of where it takes them. Which somewhat explains how Joe Biden, whose ancestors emigrated to America from Ireland during the famine, which he often likes to boast about when it serves him politically. It's been 165 years, like many of you, 165 years since my great-great-grandparents left County Mayo and County Louth aboard coffin ships to cross the Atlantic.
can joke about Irish whiskey with Benjamin Netanyahu. I think we look at each other like, who's been drinking what? But, uh, but we're, 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 we're good Irish whiskey. Good Irish whiskey. <laughs> This is because, first and foremost, Joe Biden is the so-called leader of the free world and in reality the leader of global imperialism. And Benjamin Netanyahu serves as the means by which global imperialism can expand and therefore any other factors which should make them enemies are superfluous. So long as both work together to expand the imperialist settler colonial project, of which Israel is a major part in the Middle East. Joe Biden did say this after all. Whether or not in Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. And his history of being a Zionist can truly be backed up. 35 years ago, I said, you don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist, and I'm a Zionist. <laughs> you don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. Support for Palestine is not simply support for Palestine alone. It is defiance of the imperialist powers that wish to drag Ireland and other countries into NATO to dominate and colonise the entire world and divide the resources among themselves. Since the end of World War II, Zionist interests have rooted themselves firmly in the bourgeois consciousness of the entire Western world and Ireland, regrettably, can be included in that from what we have seen in Robert Briscoe, the Zionist, being a co-founder of a party that is now in government in Ireland and therefore a member of the new bourgeoisie that was created after the establishment of the Irish Free State. He had used his experience from the Irish national liberation struggle to advance and proliferate the genocidal settler colonial project that is Zionism. Also the involvement of the black and tans like the one from Galway we had discussed earlier in the video should not lead to despair or apathy. Rather it should challenge how people approach the question of this video why does Ireland support Palestine from a class conscious perspective rather than a perspective of pitting one national territory against the other as mainstream media loves to do so much. We discussed throughout this video how the Irish working class had greatly supported the Palestinian cause while the bourgeois classes of Ireland in accordance with Ireland's position as a semi-colony of Western imperialism encouraged the Zionist project. So who are the Irish people and do they stand with Palestine? As James Connolly put it in Aaron's Hope, but who are the Irish people? Is it the dividend-hunting capitalist with the phraseology of patriotism on his lips and the spoil wrung from sweated Irish toilers in his pockets? Or is it not rather the Irish working class, the only secure foundation on which a free nation can be reared, the Irish working class which has borne the brunt of every political struggle and gained by none, and which is today the only class in Ireland which has no interest to serve in perpetuating either the political or social forms of oppression? the British connection or the capitalist system. Conley's reference to both the British connection and the capitalist system is extremely apt for this point as it is British imperialism and the capitalist system that is the root of oppression in both Ireland and Palestine. From the Statute of Kilkenny and the Penal Laws to the Balfour Declaration, British imperialism is inherently connected to the history of oppression of both colonised nations. It is right to say therefore that the working classes of both nations nations are united in struggle against a common enemy. In the words of Bobby Sands, there is an inner thing in everyone. Do you know this thing, my friend? It has withstood blows of a million years and will do so to the end. It lights the dark of this prison cell. It thunders forth its might. It's the undauntable thought, my friend, that thought that says I'm right. Thank you.